Good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining this webinar hosted by Saco System. Today, we will be discussing shortly how the market in Ten Kashkaval and how cultures can act as a natural way to prevent the microorganism causing cheese blowing. But let me introduce myself first. My name is Lucio Lepera. I have a master's degree in food science and technologies. I've been previously engaged as a line worker and R&D cheese technician for one of the biggest international dairy groups. I'm now one of the SACO sales and technical area manager in charge for Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, Turkey, and Israel. Well, for those who still doesn't know SACO system, I'm glad to introduce the group. SACO system is the culmination of international biotech excellence applied to the food, nutraceutical, and pharmaceutical industries. SACO system slogan of supporting food cultures and life communicates our company's mission to support the cultures for food and health, but also to develop cultures addressed to both humans and agriculture's animals. With the word system, we express the synergy between four companies, Cagificio Clerici, Sacco, CSL, which is Centro Sperimentale del Latte, and Cenicavo. We like to intend it as a functional network which preserves the characteristics of each singular member. The family company is investing 6% of its turnover in R&D and knowledge, knowledge. So sharing flexibility and customization are the core values of this system. SACO system has currently seven production plants. They sell in more than 110 countries through a network of agents and distributors. And over 2018, we generated a total turnover of 108 million euro. So there are more than 50 collaborations with universities around the world and technical centers. And our collaborators come from more than 20 different countries. But how does every single company can help? SACO is an Italian family-owned company that offers a large range of innovative products. This includes starter cultures for food fermentation and nutritional supplements, as well as instruments for the improvement of food. The sister company Canificio Clerici has been an Italian leader in branded production since 1872 and in 2006 acquired the Swedish company Chemicali. SACO furthermore acquired the Italian culture producer CSL in 2013. So, but let's move on Kashkaval. So for those who doesn't know what Kashkaval is, Kashkaval belongs to the pasta filata cheese and uh, its usage cover a wide range of typical dishes. For instance, it can be served over the breakfast or used as a pizza topping. On supermarket shelves, it can be found as it is, but vacuumed, in small sites or sliced. Anyway, like other stretched cheese, it can be used through many different ways. So, Kashkaval is a very old cheese. History is dated back to the 11th century. But there are many references suggesting that Kashkaval probably as an even older tradition. In fact, after being brought by nomadic tribes from the east to the Mediterranean during Roman time, it has been moved from Italy to Great Britain, adapting itself to the English condition and far later probably recalled cheddar. Nowadays, Kashkaval is known from East Europe to North Africa, the name can slightly change according to the region, but its technology is almost the same and the modern cheese engineering made its production much faster. So as you can see from the coming slide, 
Kashkaval was produced initially from raw milk and being populated by an undefined amount of bacteria, the end products were quite far each other. With the introduction of the heat treatment, such as thermization, part of the spoiling flora were partially reduced, giving a better appearance to this cheese. In this way, the producers could add the coagulants, skipping the usage of cultures. After coagulation, which length was acidity related, the manufacturer were used to cut in order to get cubes by one centimeter each. But of course, being facilities not advanced, were not able to reach an uniformity in grain sites, which could range from half to two centimeters. So the cut got was then stirred and heated up to around 40 degrees. And just according to the consistency of the cut grain, the cheesemaker could decide to proceed with the weight drainage. This step was then followed by the card acidification, which could take place in table with or without weight at ambient condition. So the length of the, of the acidification could vary from 6 to 18 hours. In these regards, we can easily point out how such condition may lead to the growth of unwanted bacteria spoiling the products. At the end of this process, after being acidified and cut in block, the, the card was then soaked in hot brine. Generally, this brine was heated up at 75 degrees and uh, uh, there was a sodium chloride addiction to 5%. And the cheese then was ripened to some extent. The modern and industrial production is uh, much shorter and technology refer to the fundamental of pizza cheese science. There is much care about the level of demineralization as a direct function of the acidification profile. Also, as a way to compete with some of the spoiling flora. Milk, after being inoculated with starter cultures, which are mostly streptococci protease positive, is clothed in 30-30 minutes to get the right coagulum strength. Acidification should start before renetting in order to let part of the micellar calcium phosphate spill out from the intergranular phase, allowing a steady drying over the vat procedures. We know that modern vats allow the achievement of 0, 6, 0, 8 centimeters grains, which are moved into a draining table at time their pH range from 6.1 to 5.8. At this time, not more than one and a half or two hours can be weighed before going to the dry cooking. So for those who doesn't know what the dry cooking is, this latter has been developed to reduce the loss of fat into the hot water, besides giving better hygiene. Unfortunately, part of the customer to further reduce the production time had started to use melting salt to stretch at higher pH. The consequence is an higher pH cheese which lack in taste. It has more possibility of being spoiled by propionic bacteria and clostridia rather than owing higher residual sugars. So after being stretched, the product is hot molded rapidly turned and kept at 10, 15 degrees. So the product is then uh, uh, dried at high speed ratio overnight. So once dried, this cascaval is then vacuumed and ripened in between eight and 10 degrees. So in this slide, we are going to see some of the issues of fear with some of our customers. And how, of course, we support them with the usage of culture as another way of protection. In the left hand side, we can see Kashkaval after two weeks of storage, developing small and quite regular holes. We took some samples and found out how the defect was completely addressed to the presence of heterofermentative lactobacilli. 
spoiling the cheese at the accent of 10 to the 6 CFU per gram. The picture in the middle shows a kashkawa spoiled by propionic acid bacteria, enumerated as 10 to the 7 CFU gram. While on the right hand side, the cheese has been spoiled by Clostridium tirobutyricum. For many customers, this defect is not expected since the product, after being acidified, undergoes temperatures ranging from 62 to almost 7 degrees for 10 minutes. So I feel the need to highlight that all those customers were licensing users at the rate of 60 ppm, namely 60 milligram per liter of milk. Very popular with Kashkaval produce is, producer is the presence of small and regular holes, mainly caused by heterofermentative lactobacilli. These small openings should, should have been misunderstood with the small splits caused by residual whey or air and trapped during the kneading. For many pasta filata cheese producers, lactobacilli are intended to be diet after the stretching procedure, but it's well known how part of the flora can undergo the harsh condition and spoil the cheese during ripening. There are many species of heterofermentative lactobacilli, for instance, Lactobacillus fermentus, fermentum or Lactobacillus brevis, which are very pro-technological for some day replication but can cause defect in pasta filata cheese as, such as cascaval. Those lactobacilli can reach 10 to the 8 UFC per gram of cheese. And they are mostly originated in raw milk and factory environment. These bacteria can produce carbon dioxide from the catabolism of glucose. Some of them are also able to slowly grow at low temperatures such as 10 degrees, making clear how these cheeses can be subjected to this defect, especially over the ripening. But if your cashkaval shows bigger and irregular eyes, this product may be spoiled by propionic bacteria or Clostridium tirobutyricum. In this slide, the picture shows a cashkawa spoiled by propionic acid bacteria in the extent of 10 to the 7 UFC per gram. Propionic acid bacteria are very well known for playing a key role in cheese production such as Emmental and Masta. But as mentioned before, in some other application, their presence is not expected. Propionic bacteria can be found in soil or high and the poor quality milk can be easily colonized by these bacteria. Propionic acid bacteria are able to produce CO2 besides propionate and acetate from the lactate catabolism, but some others, which are aspartase positive, can co-ferment aspartate and lactate as a substrate to produce carbon dioxide. Specifically, this latter need just one molecule of lactate if aspartic acid is present, acting as a booster in the production of CO2. Making it easier to produce one molecule of CO2, some needs three molecules, three molecules of lactate, while the aspartase positive just need one. Propionic acid bacteria, furthermore, grow very well at low salt concentration and pH ranging in between 6 and 7. Despite these pH values, they can anyway undergo more acid environment. If salt concentration is very low and if temperature range at mesophilic temperatures, they can easily go. Kashkaval, produced with melting salt, is generally stretched at higher pH, such 5.4 or 5.5 making this condition more favorable to the growth of propionic acid bacteria. Although propionic acid bacteria may be intended as a spoilage, cheese manufacturers are very sensitive when Clostridium tirobutyricum is mentioned. The cheese, in this case, can display big openness from hydrogen and carbon dioxide. 
Over the winter time, cow may be fed with silage, which are common to be colonized by Clostridium tuberculosis. This latter is able to grow at low temperature during the cheese ripening, causing the well-known late gas blowing. So the anaerobic conditions are essential for its growth, and lactate is generally used to produce CO2 and H2, besides butyric acid and acetic acids. Clostridium tirobutyricum, unlike the two former species, is a spore-forming, so when conditions are harsh, it is able to produce spore in which part of its DNA is preserved. And at the time the media conditions are restored, it can germinate to its vegetative form. Very low pH, generally around 4.6, are generally able to block this process. And salt also play a key role to avoid this germination. Either in this case, the use of melting salt as a way to shorten production can negatively act to avoid this kind of issues, since the product is generally stretched at higher pH, making the condition more favorable to the growth. The usage of dry cooker allowed the manufacturer to add salt, I mean sodium chloride, before melting, giving a cash cabal with an homogeneous dispersion of the sodium chloride. Some others are used to stretch with no salt. And when big volume are processed, the cooling water is set at too low temperature. As a consequence, the outside of the cheese tends to uptake some salt, but the low temperature makes the cheese ring almost waterproof, hindering the salt diffusion throughout the cheese. In this way, the core of the cheese will be low in salt and quite high in pH, allowing the germination of the spore. So one of the way to prevent uh, butyric acid fermentation has been found through the usage of bactophage. Bactophagation has been intended as a way of prevention and it's a centrifuge, therefore it works exploiting the centripetal forces and being spores, being spores denser than milk during centrifugation, they tend to settle at the side part of the centrifuge. Together with the spores, also some casings with high molecular weight settles. The sludge can be then thermal treated and reintroduced to the bacterifugal milk. However, from 3 to 5% of the spores are able to overcome this step and we should point out that in terms of energy cost of management, not all the producers can afford such kind of technology. And we have no guarantees of depleting 100% of the sporing form of flora. A double step becomes necessary since five spore milliliters may be enough to let the butyric acid fermentation to take place. Lysozym, which is found in milk, saliva tears, and other body fluids, hydrolyzes the cell walls of sensitive bacteria like Clostridium tirobutyricum, causing them to lyse. But how does it work? Lysozym cleaves bonds in the peptidoglycan of bacterial cell walls and is more active on gram positive than on gram negative bacteria because of the high levels of peptidoglycans in the cell walls of gram-positive bacteria. It is commonly used and it is added to the milk with starter at level of 25-20 mg per liter. It is generally considered to have no effects on the growth of starter, although some strains in cultures are inhibited by lysis. So, according to the law, lysozym need to be labeled as a preservative, making the products appearing as not completely natural. Another way is the usage of bacteriocin nicin, which is produced by some strains of Lactococcus lactis. It shows antimicrobial activity against a wide spectrum of gram-positive bacteria. However, it is not suitable for all the application since many strains of starter are sensitive to it. Nowadays, Kashkaval production mostly involves Streptococcus thermophilus, 
which may be combined with Lactobacillus bulgaricus and Lactobacillus helveticus. So despite the usage of niacin, some of the cheeses analyzed were anyway spoiled by Clostridia. So we have to highlight that there is a rising, rising trend of producing fully natural products, since there are many investigations and researches proving how the consumer is being addicted to read the label and make their choose on what they reputedly save. The last way to prevent the spoilage of unwanted sporing and not sporing bacteria is the usage of protective cultures, which is getting very popular with cheesemakers and raising the interest of the producer since it allows the production of a pure natural cheese with no preservatives. Protective cultures can act differently according to the species. There are bacteria in producer, organic acid producer, and the one just competing for the substrate. So, well, whatever is their mechanism, protective cultures appears on the label as part of starters or lactic acid bacteria which are definitely natural. Well, in these following slides, i like to share some of the positive feedback we got from some clients in the Middle East area. They were deeply struggling with packaging blowing, small eyes in the cheese. So that we decide to bring back to our labs some samples and after analysis, we found contamination from heterofermented lactobacilli, which were ranging, as I told before, in between 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 7. So as a natural consequence, we inoculated the milk with 10 doses of our BGP1, which is a natural lactobacillus paracasi. We were concerned about its ability to overcome the stretching procedure, but the outcome was impressive. We noticed an improvement and total reduction of the defects. BGP1 has been combined with starter. When tasted after one and three months shelf life, there were no flavors, defects, or unwanted predolysis, making the cheese softer. The acidification proceeded as usual. We have not notified, notified any delay in reaching the target. So pH was reached in the time expected. From the same area, we have analyzed cheese with different holes than the previous one. These holes were bigger and some looked like slits, easily recognizing to the growth of Clostridium Actually, the species contaminating the cheese in the pictures are propionic acid bacteria at the count of 3 to 10 to the 7. On this purpose, we decided to use our LC4P1, which is made up of two lactobacillus casein bacteriocin producer. As we know, this bacteriocin may act against gram positive bacteria. Of course, making clear the choice to use LC4P1 for this particular case. So also in this case, the results were very good and great. The cheeses outcoming were completely different. The control with lysozyme was still full of irregular and big eyes. While the defect, as you can see from the pictures in the right bottom, was much limited. So, as I mentioned, one of our main concern was the heat resistance of our protective cultures. In this particular case, the trials explained itself. In both cases, the usage of cultures showed a drastic reduction of the defect. In one of our studies carried out on Italian mozzarella, we have seen that BGP1 had three decimal reduction after being heat treated at 65 degrees. Of course, this makes the thing clearer, since we can confirm how they overcome the heat treatment. Our test has been carried out using more modern equipment, where the cart was stretched for almost 10 minutes at 68 degrees. The dry cooker works with steam at quite high pressure, generally in between four and six bars. At such condition, in few minutes, the cart is able to melt and through the screw, 
which counter rotating are able to simulate the stretching. The cheese maker can set the temperature and screw speed according to the card strength. Still, all the condensed, of course, coming from the seam, has been absorbed. So, since nowadays the usage of melting salts has become common, I'd like to point out how the higher pH can make the condition more favorable for the adventitious flora growth. On this purpose, besides protective cultures, SACO has designed a series called SD08F, which focuses on the fundamental of the pizza cheese acidification. Specifically, a reduction of the lag phase leads to a reduction of the mineral content, mainly colloidal calcium phosphate, leading to a better melting and reduction of melting salts. Lower pH, as a consequence, will result in a less probability to face lead gas blowing from Clostridia and propionic acid bacteria, since the lower pH and NaCl can hinder their growth. In addiction, the lower mineral content will lead to lower melting point when cheese is oiled. This is crucial to avoid the blistering when used as pizza topping. For example, if the cheese melts before the water boiling off, a thin layer of oil will act as a protection against the surface deterioration. Conversely, two minerals makes cheese too hard to melt. The boiling off may occur before cheese melting. As a consequence, the cheese will burn, keeping its own shape. Following our experience, I'd like to finalize and share the most successfully experience we had with our partner. For example, BGP1, BGP1 has been coupled with sd 0 f and it showed a drastic reduction of contamination by heterofermentative lactobacilli. Besides, improving acidification, kinetic, and browning issues related. So sd 0 f can go with LC4P1 as well to prevent mainly Clostridia and to some extent propionic acid bacteria as well. While in the worst case scenario, where both the contamination occurred, we also combined BGP-1 and LC4P1 as a, tool to, as a tool to prevent both gas effects. So this was the latest slide. I hope uh, you have enjoyed this short experience with us. Surely we will be back on this purpose since there are still a lot of trials ongoing. So it will be very curious to check how they will uh, evolve. So if you have any questions, I'll be glad to reply and I'm completely open to discuss. is one question coming one customer is asking if the melting salt must be used to produce cash caval so the answer is straight to no so there is uh, we we are not expected to use um, melting salt the usage of melting salt as i told before is uh, normally to reduce the production time to improve the stretchability of the product. Since at higher pH, there are, there are still some minerals been binding the proteins. On this purpose, on this purpose, the meltability, the meltability of the products can be reduced. And uh, also the, in, in terms of stretchability, for example, the usage of bacteria can be helpful, as, uh, as I mentioned before, since 
they can reduce the lag phase. Reducing the lag phase, you are going to reduce the mineral content. And as a consequence, the stretchability and the metability of the products will improve. So you can easily take over choosing uh, the right cultures. So there is another, another customer asking if our LC4B1 shows activity against other gram positive, for example, some starters. So, so far we, we did many experience with different, with different clients and uh, all our clients using LC4, LC4P1 didn't notice any uh, negative effects in the usage of LC4P1, so it can be easily used. So someone is asking if it's better to use lyophilized or uh, frozen cultures. So from my point of view, so SACO can offer a wide range of cultures. We have both lyophilized and the frozen one, both perform more or less in the same way. So you can get excellent results in terms of uh, stretchability. Also, our protective cultures, of course, can be sold in both, uh, both form. So another customer is asking, what's the impact of your cultures on production costs? So let's say that the aim of protective cultures is to reduce the market's recall. We experienced with uh, some of our customers that the drast drastic reduction of market recall makes the investment in protective cultures profitable. Market recall, besides reducing current sales, involves many other operations, such as reprocess the product, which means energy and worker extra time, and regain trust from clients lost. Yes, there is also another customer who is mentioning uh, two different products from our portfolio, which are small, which are our, let's say, Lactococcus lactis bacterios in producer. Yes, so SACO in his uh, wide range of protective culture has included also some Lactococcus lactis uh, bacterios in producer. So, so far we didn't mention, as I told you, maybe we will update uh, this presentation or we will come with a second webinar. So I decided just to show the results coming from my area, but of course also the product called MOL from our portfolio include this bacteria producing bacteria. Scene. So um, it, it would be great to trial and uh, we also noticed very good results with these products. So there is another client who tried protective cultures in the past, but they didn't work. Yes, we have been working on protective cultures for more than 20 years. Most of the clients are successfully using as a part of their own flora. From our lab's test, we got excellent results if uh, compared with our main competitors. So this result has been confirmed from clients. So we are open to send sample and discuss. Of course, we need to evaluate the level of contamination and the hygiene condition to set up the right, the right dosage. So looks, there are no, no other questions so far. So I want again to thank you everybody for watching. Uh, for further information, please you can contact us at webinar at saccosystem.com or you can mail direct to me at l.lepera at saccosrl.it. So thanks again for watching. See you again. Bye.